Welcome to the second lecture of experimental vibrations analysis. Today we will talk about mechanical vibrations and give a summary of what you should already know before taking this class. Uh, this is covered in chapters 5 and 6 of the book Noise and Vibration Analysis. So this presentation is aimed at ensuring that you have enough prior knowledge about vibrations to take this course. So if you find that there are some things you don't uh, really remember from your vibrations class of what I present today, you should go back to these chapters and uh, read up on those things. Mechanical vibrations is of course a separate course and it's a prerequ prerequisite for this course. What we're going to talk about here is the single degree of freedom S-DOT system uh, and particularly its impulse response and frequency response. And then we will talk about general multi-degree of freedom systems, MDOF systems, and we will discuss the solutions for those systems with no damping and with proportional damping and with non-proportional general damping. And then finally, we will briefly discuss the modal model or the modal parameters. So we start with a single degree of freedom system. This system consists of one mass connected to one spring and one viscous damper. Uh, we apply a force, F, to this system and we look at the resulting displacement, U. Now, a the concept of a degree of freedom really means the number of masses uh, or coordinates that are needed or used to describe a system. So in experimental cases, it means a particular point in a particular direction that we measure. Or more theoretically, in an analytical model, uh, you can compare it to a solid body for which you know that there is six degrees of freedom three translational motions and three rotations. So we start with the S of system solutions. As you know, there is one natural frequency or the undamped natural frequency, which we denote Fn in Hertz or omega n in radians per second. And uh, omega n is given by square root of k over m and thus the frequency is 1 over 2 pi times square root of k over m. And there is also a relative damping ratio uh, that we call zeta, uh, which is the damper C uh, divided by 2 square root of mass times stiffness. So here you see the uh, S-DOF impulse response. The impulse response of a single degree of freedom system contis uh, contains or consists of a, uh, an exponentially decaying sign. Here we see it for two different damping ratios. Uh, zeta uh, equals 1% in the top and 5% in the bottom plot. Now the envelope, the exponential decay, is of type e to minus at, where we know that a contains the damping zeta and the uh, natural frequency omega n. The frequency of the oscillation, oscillating part uh, is not the natural frequency, but something we call the damped natural frequency, which I is the undamped natural frequency times the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. So slightly lower, slightly smaller than the natural frequency. Although for regular zeta numbers, it's a very small difference. The frequency response of an s system uh, can be written uh, in several different ways. Here are two of the ways. So either we write it as a h of j omega, which is then a function of 1 over the mass m times j omega minus s1 times j omega minus s1 complex conjugate, where s1 is the pole of the uh, frequency of the est of system, and which can be seen at the bottom of this uh, slide where S1 is minus zeta omega n plus j omega n times square root of 1 minus zeta squared. But we can also write H of f, the frequency response, as a function of frequency in hertz. Then we get 1 over stiffness divided by 1 minus f over fn squared uh, plus j to 2 zeta times f over fn. So you see here it comes only uh, as a normalized frequency. 
the frequency axis is divided by the natural frequency. If we plot this frequency response uh, in amplitude and phase format, you see that it starts off with a constant uh, slope and a, or a zero slope, and then it goes up to a resonance and falls off as one over f squared. Uh, you should note that this maximum frequency does not occur at the same damped frequency as the uh, frequency by which the impulse response is oscillating, but another frequency, which is uh, the natural frequency times the square root of 1 minus 2 zeta squared. You should also notice that in the phase plot that the, the uh, phase is exactly minus 90 degrees, uh, where frequency is equal to the natural frequency. Here you also see uh, three diff FRFs for the same S-DOF system but with three different dampings of uh, 1%, 5% and 10%. We have a concept called resonance bandwidth which is good to know about. Uh, so if we start at the maximum of the uh, uh, amplitude of the uh, frequency response function and we go down minus 3 dB on both sides, so both left and right, uh, we obtain two frequencies, an upper frequency above the resonance and a lower frequency FL below the resonance. The 3 dB bandwidth or resonance bandwidth is then uh, defined as BR being the difference of the upper and the lower frequency. And the upper and lower frequencies are defined by the 3 dB, so if you have the magnitude squared of the lower frequency, that is equal to the magnitude squared of the upper frequency, which is then one half times the frequency response maximum squared. So the, uh, this is the resonance bandwidth. And then we ha have two relationships uh, which can give us the uh, damping. First of all, we have a damping uh, zeta, which is exactly uh, defined by the upper frequency in radians per second, so omega u squared minus omega l squared divi divided by 2 times omega max squared. But for lightly damped systems that we are mostly interested in, because this is a vibrations class or vibration analysis class, uh, the uh, this approximate can be approximated by simply taking the upper frequency minus the lower frequency divided by two times the uh, center frequency, the max frequency, and this is of course either in omega or in f gives the same result. So this can also be written as br divided by two times f max. Then we come to the general multi-degree of freedom systems. This is um, when we have more than one mass and for example two masses is the smallest uh, MDOF system you can have. Typically uh, for MDOF systems we can set up uh, mass damping and stiffness matrices uh, and we get a Newton's equation which is similar to the SDOF case but where M, uh, C and K are uh, matrices instead. And here is in the bottom equation we have the undamped case where we have m times the acceleration vector times k the stiffness matrix matrix times the velocity uh, sorry displacement vector equals the force vector. Now a system with n degrees of freedom capital N degrees of freedom will have n eigenfrequencies, or if you want, resonance frequencies. And for each eigenfrequency, there is a mode shape coming from the eigenvector, which means a standing wave, at least in the case of undamped uh, systems. So here is illustrated two mode shapes, uh, the first bending mode of a beam, say, and the second bending mode. So, we will now look at three cases for the end of system. We first have the undamped case when the damping matrix is zero. This leads 
to imaginary eigenvalues corresponding to the undamped natural frequencies uh, and to normal modes, as we say. Uh, normal modes are modes also called real valued modes or real modes uh, are modes where all points move either in or out of phase. Then we have proportional damping where the damping matrix is uh, a linear combination of the mass and stiffness matrices. This leads to complex poles similar to for the SDOT system and the same normal modes as we had for the uh, the uh, undamped case. And then in, in the more general case with non-proportional damping uh, we have complex poles again but the mode shapes are now complex mode shapes although in most cases for real systems uh, with low damping uh, the uh, complexity is only small. For MDOF systems we also have FRFs, of course, uh, and here we define an FRF matrix H, uh, with which is multiplied by the forces or the force vector to produce the displacement vector. And in this case, the fre uh, frequency response function matrix is called a receptance matrix or a dynamic flexibility matrix. And uh, a row here defines a uh, response degree of freedom, whereas a column in H uh, represents a force degree of freedom. To compute the MDOF frequency response matrix, uh, we can either do it from knowing M, C and K or from the modal parameters. And if we do it from the frequency response matrix, or uh, sorry, from the uh, M, C, K, then we simply uh, compute minus omega squared times the mass matrix plus j omega times the c, ma uh, c matrix plus k. And then we take this entire matrix and invert it. But if we have the modal parameters, we can instead for a single uh, frequency response function compute it as a sum over all the modes of the mode shape coefficient psi pr times psi qr, the other mode shape coefficient, if we are talking about a frequency response between dof p and q, response in p, force in q. So the sum of these, this product of mode shape coefficients divided by the, mo uh, the uh, modal mass times j omega minus sr times j omega minus sr complex, complex conjugate, where sr is the pole of mode r. This can also be written similarly uh, or analog with the what we did for the SDOF system uh, by using uh, uh, this uh, expression, psi PR times psi QR divided by KR, the modal stiffness, divided by one, one minus F over FR squared plus J2 zeta R times F over FR and summed over all the modes. This means that a single frequency response function is built up of SDOF system-like FRFs. So the fat line here is the 4DOF uh, FRF or an FRF from a 4DOF system, whereas there, is f there are four uh, separate FRFs of SDOF systems summing up to this unique FRF. So looking at the modal model, we can now explain how high the FRF peaks are, or what determines how high the FRF peaks are. Uh, and first of all, a peak is proportional to 1 over the damping of the, mo the mode in question, and then the two mode shape coefficients in the two points we measure the FRF between, so psi PR and psi QR. So here we have an example. Uh, here we have a beam which is uh, 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 pinned in both ends and then we have the first mode shape and the second mode shape. And if we excite this uh, slightly to the right of the middle, 
Uh, so we have a force FQ there. And then we measure the displacement where it's indicated here. Uh, then for the first mode, we have large mode shape coefficients, both psi, psi QR and psi PR. Whereas for the second mode, we have a small mode shape coefficient, psi QR, because we are exciting the second uh, mode close to its middle. This will mean that the first peak for the first mode is a high peak compared to the next peak. So the FRF will look like this. This concludes the current lecture. Now you can go to the book and read the uh, relevant chapter and uh, work through the examples at the end of the uh, chapter. Then you should also go to the chapter examples in the Abravibe toolbox and read through these and run them and make sure that you understand all the steps involved. If you haven't yet downloaded the toolbox, you sh should do so at www.abravibe.com. Welcome back to the next lecture when you have worked through this.